morning. All right, who's here for extra credit? Awesome. If it wasn't for you people, we'd only have one of these. <laughs> Welcome to Livermore in the Bankhead Theater. A distinct thanks goes to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for providing this exciting science series for students and the community. Our topic today, it's a gust about time, harnessing the wind for our future energy needs. Why is wind power so very popular? Anybody else? It's not what you think. It's because it has so many fans. Oh. <laughs> we have all seen these fans that grace our valley hills to the east. Those wind flowers, as I call them, started over 20 years ago, and at the time, they were the big, largest concentration of wind turbines in the world. So what is the science, the science behind generating power using the wind? Today's presenters, Dr. Jeff Majorca, Dr. Sonia Wharton of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and Ms. Christine Tyler of Gale Ranch Middle School will answer that question for you. Dr. Majorca is an atmospheric scientist and the technical leader of the lab's wind energy research group. Among his many academic accomplishments, he holds a PhD in atmospheric and planetary and atmospheric sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Wharton is a researcher in the Climate Carbon Science Group, also at the laboratory. Her primary research involves understanding how the conditions in atmospheric boundary layer impact wind power generation. Her PhD is in atmospheric science from UC Davis. Christine Tyler is a science teacher at Gale Ranch Middle School in San Ramon. Prior to teaching, Ms. Tyler works as a research scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in geophysics. Christine is currently working on her master's in education technology leadership. So please put your hands together for Jeff, Sonia, and Christine. Okay, so we're gonna learn, learn a little bit about wind energy. So hit it, Jeff. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody for coming out on a beautiful day. So as we all know, Modern human civilization uses a tremendous amount of power. And the projections are that we're only going to increase our use of power in the coming decades. Even though we're getting more efficient at the way we use some of our appliances, transportation, and the like, we keep using more and more of them. And not only that, but more and more people are going to be using power like we do in the developed, in the developed world in the coming decades. And satisfying this insatiable demand for power that humanity has uh, with sources of energy that don't harm the environment stands as one of the significant challenges facing future generations, including all of you. So how do we get energy that we use today? Well, most of it comes from fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Now, there are a couple of problems with getting our energy this way. One of them is, Frankly, there's a finite supply. These are not renewable on the time scale that we need them to, and most of the cheap and easy to obtain sources of these fuels are going to run out in our lifetimes. While there are still fossil fuel remains of different forms, extracting those into usable energy in a way that doesn't harm the environment is going to become increasingly expensive and difficult in the future. But beyond these issues, the biggest concern is that the way that we use fossil fuels presently creates pollution. And among the pollutants of most importance is carbon dioxide. Now, if you come to next week's talk, you'll get to learn a little bit more about carbon dioxide and the role that it plays in the climate system. But briefly, carbon dioxide, as you all know, is a greenhouse gas. And what that means is that it absorbs radiation leaving the Earth's surface that would otherwise escape into space. And as a result, more heat stays in the atmosphere. Now, a certain amount of this greenhouse effect is natural and even beneficial to life on the planet. However, there is growing evidence that suggests that humans' increase of CO2, the, the increase in, of CO2 in the atmosphere due to humans burning fossil fuels has increased the greenhouse effect beyond its natural dimensions. And this has actually led to a warming of the atmosphere. And in addition to the warming of the atmosphere, it's also changed climate patterns and is putting stress on ecosystems, the ecosystems upon which all life, including ours, depends. 
So what are our solutions? We need green, renewable sources of energy. Green means that they won't hurt the environment, so they won't pollute the air and they won't pollute our waterways. Renewable means that we won't run out of them, right? So these are infinite sources of energy, unlike fossil fuels. One of these sources of renewable energy is wind energy, and this is the one we're going to be talking about today. And wind energy is being deployed on a massive scale, and that's because it's clean, abundant, and it doesn't hurt the ecosystems. It doesn't hurt the environment. So now we have a happy Earth instead of that Earth with the fire over it. And what this does is it protects the ecosystems. And these are ecosystems that all of us depend on. So we depend on them, and all species depend on them, including the polar bears. OK, so today you're going to learn four things. The first of which is, why does the wind blow? The second is, how do modern wind turbines actually harness the wind to produce energy? The third of which is the role of science and engineering in, in, um, in actually in, in wind capture and wind energy capture. And then the fourth is challenges that we're going to ask you to solve in your future. So where does the wind ultimately come from? Well, it comes from physical forces that we understand. One of them is that different amounts of the Earth, different amounts of solar radiation heat different parts of the planet differently, and that causes wind currents to develop to transfer that heat around. Then there's the rotation of the underlying planet. And finally, there are different surface characteristics. And we'll look at examples of all of these things. So ultimately, almost all of the energy that we have available to us on the Earth comes from the sun. And this includes the fossil fuels that we've been using. Fossil fuels really represent the accumulated solar energy over hundreds of millions of years that's built up in the tissues of plants and animals that have, have died and, and been transformed into our fossil fuels in the Earth's crust. So what does that have to do with the wind today? Well, even the solar radi radiation hitting the Earth right now is driving wind currents. And we can understand how that happens. The sun is a sphere that radiates in all directions. And solar radiation travels off of the surface of this sphere and expands outward into space. So it travels through space at the speed of light. On, and at any moment in time, the amount of energy contained on the surface of a sphere is constant. But the sphere itself is increasing in size. And therefore, that radiation is becoming more dispersed to maintain the same amount of total radiation on the ever-increasing sphere. The other thing that happens as this sphere of radiation moves towards the Earth is that it gets larger and larger, so large, in fact, that by the time that sphere intersects the Earth's orbit, it looks essentially like a plane of uniform radiation falling across the diameter of the Earth. The radiation, by the time it gets to the Earth, is about 1,336 watts per meter squared at the plane incident to the Earth's orbit. So a watt is a unit of the flow of energy. The fundamental unit of energy is a joule. So a unit of a flow of energy is a joule per second. So this is the amount of radiation that's streaming towards the Earth every second. And the watt per square meter is the amount of this energy that's contained within a unit one meter square in the plane of incident solar radiation hitting the planet. Now, what does it do when it actually gets here? Well, you have an incident plane of radiation that has a uniform density of energy flowing across it. However, the, the Earth's surface that it hits is curved. And because of that, that energy is distributed differently over different parts of the planet. And a little bit of geometry can show us how that works. So suppose you have a unit one meter square plane of radiation coming into the Earth's orbit, and it hits the part of the Earth at the equator. Well, the plane surface of that portion of the Earth is perpendicular to the incoming rays of radiation. So all of the radiation contained in that unit square of the incident plane lands on a unit square on the Earth's surface. So the Earth's surface there absorbs all of that solar radiation. However, when we move up to higher latitudes, that same energy contained in one square meter of incoming radiation is spread over a surface that's tilted away from that incoming plane. And because of that, that surface area that's tilted away is actually larger than the unit area coming in, and the radiation spreads out. And as we move towards higher latitudes, up towards the poles, this result gets larger and larger. You spread out that same amount of incoming radiation over an increasingly large area. And what this results in is that you get less radiation at the poles than you get at the lower latitudes. 
Now, anybody who's seen a little bit of trigonometry can tell you that you can compute the amount of solar radiation per unit area landing on the surface of the Earth as the product of the amount in the incoming plane of radiation times the cosine of the latitude, which is just the angle formed between where you are on the Earth's surface and the equator. So we can simply compute the amount of energy per unit square meter falling on the Earth's surface as we move away from the equator. And we can see that the further and further away from the equator we get, the less radiation there is falling on each square meter of the Earth's surface. OK, so more radiation, less radiation. Well, what happens when you stand in the sun? You get hot, right? And the same thing happens to the, Earth, to the Earth's surface. The more radiation it absorbs, the hotter it gets. So if you have different amounts of the Earth's surface absorbing different amounts of radiation, you're going to have temperature differences. And those temperature differences drive circulations that move the air around. So what's the one thing that we all know that hot air does? Hot air rises. So the hot air near the equator starts to rise. Now this happens because there's a buoyancy force. The warmer a volume of air is, the more energetic its molecules are. And so those molecules jiggle around more energetically and they spread themselves out so that a given volume of a warmer fluid has less mass than a given volume of a colder fluid. And this is how hot air balloons work, right? So air currents in the atmosphere work under the same physics. So why doesn't the atmospheric air that's warmed near the equator just keep rising away all the way into space? Well, a hot air balloon will only rise for as long as the temperature surrounding the balloon is, is colder. As soon as the temperature surrounding the balloon is warmer, it won't experience that same buoyant force. Well, if you look at the structure of the Earth's atmosphere, once you get above the top of the thunderclouds at about 10,000 meters, there's ozone up there, right? We all know about the ozone layer. Well, the ozone layer does two very important things. One is it protects us from ultraviolet radiation. It does, though, by absorbing that radiation. And because it absorbs that radiation, it warms. So this warming effect creates a natural lid on the rising air motions. So these rising air motions sort of hit the top of the layer over which they can rise, and then they spread out, and they flow towards the poles. Now this air that rises has to be replaced. So air comes back in from the poles towards the equator. And the same thing happens in the southern hemisphere. So on a very simple planet that was frozen in space, you would have these very simple cellular convection cells that will move air from the warm tropics to the cold poles and back. However, we all know from living on the Earth that the winds predominantly blow in the easterly and westerly directions, not north and south. Why is that? That's because our planet rotates. The rotation of the planet actually deflects the simple patterns into more complicated ones. And while this is too complicated to analyze in full detail here, I just want to give you a picture that even though it's somewhat complicated, it's also comprehensible. The winds organize themselves predominantly in the easterlies near the equator, and then we have westerlies at the mid-latitudes, and then easterlies near the pole again, near the poles. And the overturning circulations in the vertical plane, indicated by the red arrows, organize themselves into three cells. And these three cells, while are very small, the, 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 uh, the motion of the air is very small in, in, in relation to the horizontal motions, they do define some aspects of our planet, such as the deserts that occur at about 30 degrees of latitude where the cells have descending air, and also the polar front that divides the very cold air from the poles from the warmer air below. And we'll experience the passage of the polar front, cold, polar front later this week when rain and, and cold temperatures return. So the Earth isn't the only planet that has horizontal bands of winds. In fact, all rotating planets in our, in our planetary solar system that have atmospheres have these rotating bands of horizontally moving winds. And that's because these arise due to the fundamental physics of the way fluids move on rotating surfaces. So Jeff just explained to us how global circulations influence wind speed here on Earth. But there are features at, on the ground level that also influence how wind is directed. Some of those are topography, and one is the land sea breeze effect. So the sea breeze effect is what we feel here in California. So in the summer, when the Central Valley gets really warm, gets, say, 105 degrees on a summer day, remember how the coast is always much cooler. Well, what's happening is, over the Central Valley, that land is warming up, and that's heating the air right above it. And when that, when that air heats up, it becomes less dense. It becomes buoyant, 
and it rises, right? And that's the red arrows there on the picture in front of you. So because of conservation of mass, if you're removing air and if it's rising upwards, something has to replace it, right? And that's these cold winds that come in from over the ocean. Because as we all know, when you go to the Pacific Ocean here and you want to go for a swim, the water's really cold, isn't it? And so that keeps the air above the ocean really cold too. And that's more dense air. So it comes in and we get these strong westerly winds. We take advantage of this here in the Altamont Hills. We have these turbines up in the, in the hills right next to us, right? And you'll see them spinning really fast in the spring and the summer. And that's because they're taking advantage of this strong sea breeze effect. So now that we understand how wind is made, let's see if we can actually make some electricity from it. So I've got Christine here to help me and some students. So I found a couple of, uh, of students from different schools to help us out. And they're going to tell us first their names, their grades, and what schools they go to. And we'll start with Claire. So go ahead. You're Claire. Hi, my name is Claire. I am in the eighth grade, and I go to Hart Middle School. Hi, I'm Joseph. I'm a sophomore at Amador. Hi, I'm Davis, and I'm a freshman at Tracy I. I'm Alec. I'm a seventh grader at Pine Valley Middle School. I'm Paulina, and I go to um, Sunset Elementary. I'm in fourth grade. I'm Vera, and I go to Mendenhall Middle School, and I'm in seventh grade. Okay, so we've divided them up into actually into two teams. And so my team, Claire here, is going to go sit down and she's going to read a voltmeter for us why, why you attempt Use using electrical energy to produce winds, wind power, okay? So we have the fan on the floor here. And we're going to see, notice my team only consists of two people, but I have a high school So student. these are actually mock so. turbines. And these are actually pretty realistic to what turbines look like out in the hills. So what we're going to do is with the fan, we're going to move the blades, and that's going to generate electricity through the generator. And that electricity is going to be measured with a voltmeter, which is right here. Is it turned on? Yes, it is. OK. So the faster the blades go around, the more lights that are going to light up on the voltmeter. And you're going to call out to see what voltage we're making. So the idea is let's make as much electricity as possible. OK, so what Davis doesn't know, because we haven't really told him, is that he has to figure out how high to hold the fan and how far away from the turbine in order to get the most energy out of it. So we're going to see if he can um, just turn on the fan, just let it roar. Let's see how much energy you can produce, Davis. So you're going to face Claire, and you're going to try and get this turbine to, to spin. And what we found out is that actually, since you're so tall, the higher you hold it, the more energy you may be able to produce. And it looks like Claire's hair might be in the way of the camera. There we go, Claire. Oh my gosh, <laughs> he's up to about what one point. Claire, you got to read the volts here. What do we have? We have one volt. Oh, oh about one. one. Come on, Davis. You're in high school. You can do better than that. Let's go. Lots more energy. <laughs> up. One point two five. All right, Almost we're going to max Davis out at 1.25 volts. That's not a All lot, right. but he got, he got at least a volt. Good job, Davis. You can yeah. turn the fan off. Thank you. OK. And then we'll have you sit down at the table. Are you guys ready? OK, so you've already noticed that the next team actually consists of four students. We did that on purpose because they're at a slight disadvantage. Instead of using electrical power to create wind energy, which really doesn't make a lot of sense because we're using electrical energy to produce wind energy. Why not just use electrical energy? So instead, they're going to use their brute strength. And hopefully, they ate their Wheaties this morning because they're really going to have to work hard to get this turbine to, to spin. We're trying to beat 1.25 volts. I think you can do it. All right. Your weapon. Come on, team. Your there we go. Now, I've got four members, so I think I'm going to beat the fan. What do you guys think? What do so you girls Davis, think? He worked so hard yeah. with that electrical Yeah, we're we going to beat the fan? Yes. OK, let's so let's come up to the turbine. Are you going to read the volts? Now, they also have to learn that each okay, one of them so has to take a blade, blade. otherwise it's never going to work. You so there's a little teamwork needed here. And having just one met, one we're not so sure about team dynamics. OK, you ready, girls? Is okay. your voltmeter turned on? Yeah. It is turned on. OK, let's see. 1.25 is the number to beat. Let's see if you can do it. Go. Fast, 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 fast. Come on, Alec. You can do it. Come on. Go, 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 All go, right. go, 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 go. It takes a lot of work. What are we getting on the voltmeter? You told me you ate your Wheaties. Let's go. Oh, one. come on, 0.25. Can they do better than that? I don't know. Come on. 
You're doing pretty good, Ooh. actually. Yeah, go, go, go. Don't quit on me yet. Don't quit on me yet. If you chase You're the blades, it might work. Oh. Oh. All right, we're going to pull it at 0.5 volts. And they're exhausted. <laughs> so you can give them a round good of applause. Job. OK. So for participating today, we pay in heavy metals, AKA slinkies. So we thank you very much and you guys can go sit down. Okay, so each person's gonna get a slinky. Thank you so much. You're exhausted now, you can go sleep in your seats. Okay. So we learned that between the two demos, obviously it takes a lot of work to produce wind energy. And so Somi's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Right. So this is the equation for how power is actually produced by a wind turbine. All the variables on the right influence the power production. This equation looks rather complicated, but we're going to step through it, and as you'll be able to see, that power is actually related to some pretty simple concepts. So what were we doing over there with the turbines? We were making wind, right? So that's the first variable I'm going to talk about. And as a meteorologist, I use a big capital U for wind speed. So power is related to U cubed, or U times U times U. So you can clearly see that the more wind that is, the more wind that occurs, the more power you produce. Now I forgot to mention before she started speaking, but as a teacher, I always warn my students when there's gonna be a quiz. So here's your warning. <laughs> there will be a quiz in just a second. So pay attention. Okay, so now you were told. You can't tell me you weren't, not, you weren't told. Um, the second variable that we just that is in this equation that looks so complicated but it's really not is simply density. And most of you have already learned about density. The formula for density that you learned is that it's mass divided by volume. So the more mass you have, the more dense you the more dense air you'll 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 have. Since density is actually very difficult for atmospheric scientists to measure, they use something called the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law relates pressure and temperature to density, which are two variables that they actually can measure quite well. It simply tells you that density is inversely related to temperature. So what does that mean? Well, that simply means that if you have a high density, you're going to have cold temperatures. And if you have a, low t or a high temperature, you're going to have a low density, right? So now we're very familiar with density. What is the other variable? So those two variables are parameters that represent the state of the atmosphere at any time. But we use turbines to collect power. And turbines are engineered objects. So A is the first of the last two parameters that defines an aspect of the turbine. A is the area that's swept out by the rotor plane, meaning that as each of the turbine blades rotates around, it forms a circle. And the circle has a given area. Now, we should recall that area is equal to pi r squared, where r is the radius. Well, the radius is the length of the blade of the turbine. So this is how those variables are related in wind turbines. Now, what this equation tells us so far is how much power there is available within the wind in a given area. But unfortunately, wind turbines are not 100% efficient at capturing the power that's available. And so we have one more parameter, which is called the efficiency factor. And that accounts for the fact that the turbines are not 100% efficient. In fact, most efficiency factors are around a third or so. So through better engineering, we can get significantly more power given the same flow of wind. So we've all seen that this equation, although it looked complicated at first, is actually pretty simple. And it's related to things that we can have some physical insights about. So let's see if we can use this equation to tell us some things about wind energy. Quiz time. <laughs> so the first question is, which atmospheric condition are best for wind energy? What do you think? What do you need? Yeah. Yeah, which answer? What do you think? She thinks it's B, which is windy and hot. Hmm, let's see if she's right. We're going to walk through it and see how you did. OK, so in the answer, there's windy and calm, which defines the wind speed. And the wind speed, as Sonia just told us, is the variable u. And we can see that since u is on the right-hand side, the bigger u gets the bigger the power is going to get. So we can immediately cross off the two calm ones, right? But there's a little problem with the second part of that answer, um, which it was close. So we don't see temperature, hot or cold, appearing directly in this equation. But if you'll remember from the last slide, we can relate the density to the temperature, right, through the ideal gas law. 
And it's an inverse relationship, meaning that as temperature goes up, the density goes down. So actually, you don't want windy and hot conditions. You want windy and cold conditions, because that increases the density, which increases the right-hand side of the equation. But it was a nice try. But it was a nice I'd try. I'd still give you an A. So question number two. How much more power can we produce if we double the wind speed? Does anyone have a guess? Somebody up here. How about you? Yeah, you in the front row, right there, yeah. What do you think? Eight times. Why? Can you walk us through how you did that? I'm the gentleman who's talking. So he's doubling the wind speed. And so Sonia can walk through the slides. He simply just doubled you. So that's exactly right. So we're talking about wind speed. Remember, we use the big U for wind speed. We're doubling it, so we put a 2 in front of it. But we have it to the third power, so we have to distribute the exponent. So when we do this, we have 2 times 2 times 2, or 8. So if you double the wind speed, you get 8 times the amount of power. So it was a great answer. All right, we'll have to turn these up a little bit on difficulty. <laughs> Let's Get see if we can answer how much more power we can produce if we double the length of each of the blades. Whew, this one's a tough one. If you double the length of each of the blades, are you going to be, what, or how much more energy are you going to be able to get out? You think less? Hmm, your answers actually are all in more energy terms. So you can get out either two times more energy, four times, six times, or eight times. How about in the purple? Yeah. B, four times, why? Well, I think uh, the efficiency She's definitely very good at her math, but unfortunately not the right answer. You made it more difficult tricky. than it needed to be. <laughs> okay, so Jeff's going to walk through it so we Let's can all see the answer. Let's see how she did. She can, yeah. Good try, though. All right, the relevant variable here is the area, right? Because remember from the last slide that area is equal to pi r squared, where r is the turbine's length, the blade of the, the length of the turbine blade. So we can simply substitute a equals pi r squared into the equation, and we're actually doubling the length of the blade, which is the radius, right? So does anyone remember the trick from last time? We have to distribute the exponent through the parentheses, so we end up producing four times more power. OK, so final question, which of course is the most difficult of all, so the most challenging for those of you that are into math. We're going to not only double wind speed, but we're also going to double the length of the blade. So how much more energy do you think that we're going to produce by building bigger turbines and having more wind blow across them? Don't hear. Okay. She thinks 32 times. How did you figure that out? She doubled U and she doubled R while distributing the exponents. And once again, she was able to get 8U and 4R, which gives us a total of 32. 8 times 4 is 32. So 32 times the speed. The more efficient we can build our windmills means the more power we're going to be able to get out of them. So what these simple equations have told us are some very fundamental things about wind energy and how we can make wind energy better. One of those is answers, one of the answers to those, those problems tells us why wind turbines are getting so much taller. It has to do with the fact that the average wind speed above the surface increases the further away from the surface that you get. And that's because there are frictional effects at the surface. Not only is there the surface itself, but there are also bushes and trees and other things like that. And once you can get up above all of that, the wind speeds are much greater. So this is called the atmospheric boundary layer. And this is the part of the boundary layer that we as wind energy meteorologists and engineers study. So you can see from this image that the taller turbine is able to sample, sample faster winds. But the other thing that you can do if you have a taller turbine is you can use longer blades. So we just saw in the previous example that if you can double the wind speed and double the length of each blade, you can produce 32 times more power. And with taller turbines, you can achieve both of those goals. 
Now, while turbine blades, turbines are getting taller, their blades are also getting bigger. And if you've ever seen one of these things going down the freeway on the back of a truck or on a train, they're really huge structures. And there are some differences between these wings and the wings that we have on the turbines over there. One is that unlike the turbine blades that actually just passively moved when the wind hit them, wind turbines are shaped like airplane wings. They actually generate lift as they rotate through the wind. Whereas an airplane wing creates lift in the vertical direction that pulls the plane up off the ground, the wind turbine blades generate lift that causes the wind turbine to turn even faster in the plane of rotation. Now, while there are some similarities with airplane wings, there are also some differences. One significant difference is that while an airplane wing flies through the air at the same speed, in other words, the entire wing is moving at the same speed through the air, the same thing doesn't happen with wind turbines, because wind turbines rotate. And as they rotate around, every point on the blade has to move through the same angle in the same amount of time. So the farther you are away, the faster the end of the blade has to move. So if we were had the same shape along the length of that blade, and we were generating, the, and the lift was a function of the wind speed, then the faster the ends of the turbines turned, the more, wind the more lift you would create at the end of the turbines. And this would be bad for, for, for the blades. So instead, we have wind turbine blades that twist and change shape along their length. And this allows the wind turbine to produce the same amount of lift across the entire length of the blade, um, even though the ends of the blades are moving more quickly. OK, so now that we learned that the blades are shaped um, differently, um, Jeff's actually going to model for you the internal structure of a wind turbine. So as the wind blows, it turns the blades. As the blades turn, it actually turns a generator, which is inside, which is in the internal mechanism of the, of the turbine. The, the generator is, is producing the power. So, um, and so that's how we get power out of wind turbines. The, um, the yaw, as it's called, it actually allows the turbine itself to rotate so that it's perpendicular to any sort of incoming wind system. That way we're increasing efficiency from our fans by facing directly into the wind to get the most energy out of them. The third component is the pitch. And the pitch allows, just as Jeff was mentioning, to turn the blades so that they can get the most flow over the blades to get the most energy out of the wind. All of these engineering techniques have gone into designing this wind turbine to make it more efficient and thus producing more power for the future. Okay. <laughs> so we understand how the wind turbine um, will, we, we want to understand how the wind turbine, even, even though we have all these complicated controls, um, we can't manufacture power from the wind under all wind conditions. There's only a range over which we can generate power. And the way we look at that is, is through a power curve, which plots power on the y-axis against the wind speed that's blowing. So the per power curve for all turbines looks very similar, and it has this characteristic shape. <laughs> now, this looks like a very complicated shape, but actually it's quite simple once you understand the physics behind it. As we saw from our demonstration, it takes a lot of energy to get the wind turbines moving in the first place. So there's a certain range of wind speeds over which one cannot produce any power at all. They're wind turbines. You can only produce power when it's windy. So there's a speed called the cut-in speed at which there's finally enough energy within the wind that you can start turning the turbines. So you start making a little bit of power. So when you look at the next section of the curve, you see that it increases very rapidly. And some of you might recognize this as a cubic function, because this is the part of the power curve where the, wind, the power is proportional to the cube of the wind speed. So for every two units you go over on the x-axis, you go up eight units on the y-axis. But we can't do this forever, because turbines are only engin engineered to produce a certain amount of power and to withstand certain loads. Above a certain speed, the, the turbine can't rotate any faster. The turbine still produces power, but it produces the same amount of power across a range of wind speeds. And this is what's called the rated power. This is the power that's stamped onto the nameplate of the machine, and it tells you what it's designed to produce. So when it's in rated power, it'll be producing a certain amount of energy. And we saw the unit of a watt before, but watts are really small. What modern turbines are rated in is megawatts, which are millions of watts. And the, most of the big wind turbines that you see out there are one to two megawatts per turbine. So 
How is it that you can create the same amount of power even though the wind speed is increasing? Well, remember the last demonstration. You can pitch the blades. So that's what these large wind turbines do. Once they get into their sweet spot, they can pitch the blades, regardless of how the winds are changing, and they can achieve the same power, even as the wind speed is increasing. But up to a certain point, they can't operate safely anymore, and at that point, they're shut down. And this is called the cutout speed, which is approximately 25 meters per second or so. And after cutout speed, it's just too windy, it's too unsafe to fly the turbine, so they shut them down to preserve them. That's why sometimes, even when it's really windy, you see none of the turbines are actually turning. So we see now how the wind turbine actually responds to different wind speeds through the power curve. But the question is, how well do we understand what the wind speeds really are at the heights at which wind turbines operate? And the answer is, not all that well. And the reason for this is that we simply haven't measured the atmosphere at the heights where wind turbines operate as much as we've measured other parts of the atmosphere. For instance, standard meteorological observations are typically taken in the lowest few meters of the surface on little towers. We also launch weather balloons, but weather balloons don't start re reporting reliable wind speeds until you get up above the tops of most wind turbines. So there's this portion of the atmosphere that we don't know as much about as we'd like to. So we would like to learn more about that, and the way to do that is to go out and measure it. And that's what Sonia does. So this is where I come in. I actually put up measurement, I actually put up instruments so that we can take measurements of wind speed and wind direction at turbine heights. So Jeff is gonna help me today, and we're gonna carry out my favorite piece of meteorological instrumentation, carefully. So this right here is a sonic anemometer. That's kind of a big word, isn't it? So basically, all it means is it uses sound waves to measure wind speed. So you won't see any moving parts. So on a windy day, this is gonna stay still. It's not gonna move like a cup anemometer would. And it's got these claw-like features, right? And at the end of each claw is a probe that transmits sound waves. So a sound wave will travel from here to here and then back again from here to here. And it does it in, along three axes. And it uses geometry then to measure wind speed across the different planes. So this measures wind speed and it'll give us a voltage. The voltage comes down the cords right here and will go into the data logger. So this data logger I've programmed so you can see all the little cables running into here. And the data logger then takes the voltages and it computes wind speed, which we can see right here. So now we see these lines moving across the screen, right? And what does that mean? We've got wind in different directions. We have an X component of wind, a Y component of wind, and a Z component of wind. And I'll explain what these are in a second. So the red line is gonna be the X component of wind. And you can think of that as the east-westerly direction, because remember, wind is a vector, right? So it's got a, a direction and a magnitude. And as Jeff puts the fan up, facing the sonic anemometer, you should be able to see the red line start to increase, and we do. So the fan has been turned on, and the red line has increased, and that means the X component of wind speed has increased. You'll also notice that the lines were relatively flat before Jeff came up, and that's because there wasn't much going on right next to the instrument. But once he turned the fan on, we got quite a bit of turbulence, and the instrument actually measures at a really fast rate. It measures 10 times a second. So in, when I say one Mississippi, that's relatively one second, right? The instrument has actually measured wind speed 10 times in the amount of time. So this is the nice X component, and if you show us the Y component, which is the north-south component of wind speed, we should expect that red line to go down. Do we see that? Yeah. What do you guys think? Do we see the red line go down? Yeah. yeah? And the blue line should go up now. Is the blue line going up? Right, so now wind is coming from the north-south direction. But there's another direction, there's another velocity, and that's the vertical component. And this is something that we normally don't feel very strongly, unless we're in an airplane and there's a lot of turbulence. You know, when you're in an airplane and the airplane moves around. So now we should see the green line go up. Do we see the green line go up? Uh, a little bit? What do you guys think? Yeah, it's starting to go up? Okay, well, the green-black line is starting to go up. So that's the vertical velocity. 
say thank you, Jeff. Let's give him a round of applause. So I don't just use instruments like sonic anemometers, because a sonic anemometer you actually have to put on a meteorological tower. And that's what we have on the left-hand side of this slide. And this is a meteorological tower that's out at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It's 50 meters tall, so if I want to measure wind speed at 50 meters, I have to put a sonic anemometer at the top of that. And this tower actually does have wind speed at various heights along the tower. But again, it only reaches 50 meters. So another instrument that I use is called a LIDAR. And a LIDAR is there on the right-hand side. And the LIDAR is actually a lot more sophisticated. And I didn't bring it in today because it wouldn't be able to measure wind speed in this building because it goes up to really tall heights. It goes up to 200 meters. And the way it does that is it shoots out laser beams. So it's shooting out laser beams in four different directions and measures wind speed and turbulence and wind direction at all heights that a wind rotor is going to encounter. So this gives us really good data to know what wind speed is, and then we're able to estimate how much power you can get from a turbine. So these observations that Sonia has been describing for you are observations that we're currently taking at a Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory-owned facility just a little bit east of town in the Altamont Hills that's very close to where the Altamont wind farms are, have been located and operating for a long time. Um, these instruments that we have are normally out there doing their good work. Now, the reason that the laboratory is involved in this is because we need more than just observations to help improve wind power, but we also need to analyze those data. We need to create models, both physical and computational models, so that we can better understand how to predict the winds and how to make energy more efficiently and more reliable, more reliably. This also involves the use of supercomputers, of which Lawrence Livermore Laboratory has an abundance of. So I want to talk for just a little bit about modeling, because what Sonia just described is the work that she does, which is mainly observational and data analysis. But one of the things that we can do with those observations is that we can build computational models. So I promise not to go through all of these equations, because unlike the ones that we saw earlier, these are actually really difficult. But the way a computational model basically works is that you take some part of the surface of the Earth. It could be the entire Earth. And if you want to see global climate models, you can come to next week's talk. But for wind energy, we look at a smaller subset of the Earth, and we divide the Earth up into a bunch of little cubes. And we solve the equations that describe all of the different physical processes that happen in the atmosphere at each point within these cubes. So it ends up being a lot of equations, a lot of cubes, and you end up needing to compute the solution over and over again, many, many time steps to get your answer. And this is why we have to use supercomputers. So what do we get with a model? Why, why even bother doing this? Well, one of the reasons is that you can't observe the atmosphere everywhere. So what you do is you set up observations somewhere, and then you validate the model against those observations. If you do this over a select number of places, you can then use the model to compute the solution where you can't take measurements and hopefully get a reliable picture of what the wind situation looks like in that region that you haven't actually directly measured. So one example of how observations and models can be used together is is you generate things like wind maps. And so this is showing what wind speed is like for the state of California. And the different colors represent different wind speeds. So the green colors are lower wind speeds, and the red and the yellows are highest wind speeds. So you can see in the southern part of the state, there's little regions where you get really high wind speeds, and those tend to be on the tops of ridges or on the tops of mountain passes. And like we talked about, as you go up into the atmosphere, right, the wind speed increases. We saw that curve of increasing wind speed. Well, putting turbines on top of mountain passes takes advantage of that. But there's a second feature, and that's what occurs where we live. And this is what I talked about earlier, the sea breeze effect. So we get really strong winds from the west. And we take advantage of this by putting up wind turbines in the Altamont Hills. That's the lower red blob. That's where we live, and that's where we see the turbines in our backyard. And this takes advantage of those really strong winds coming from the Pacific Ocean. But just north of us is a second place that has really strong wind energy. And that's right across from the delta. Um, right across from Pittsburgh. 
And there are thousands of turbines there that are taking advantage of this channeled flow, this really strong channeled flow from the ocean. So that's what the wind situation looks like in California. And we see there are some places where you can produce a lot of energy here in California. But how does that compare with the rest of the nation? And we see that in comparison to the US as a whole, those locations in California are pretty small. And while they've worked well for supplying local cities nearby, like us, with energy, in order to really meet the growing energy demand of the nation as a whole, we're going to have to branch out, and we're going to have to plant these wind farms in the places where the winds blow the strongest. And those are the areas indicated, again, by the reds and the purples. And we see that those predominate in the central Great Plains of the United States. So this is really where you see a lot of new wind turbines going up and where we'll continue to see a lot of new wind turbines go up in the future. And at this point, the model simulations like this have validated. We are able to produce a tremendous amount of power out there because the wind blows really well. However, there's only one problem with this, and that is, at present, the wind power resource is the greatest where there aren't very many people there to use it. Most of the people in the United States and on the planet as a whole live along the coasts. And so one of the remaining challenges that we have to confront and you have to confront as upcoming scientists and engineers is how do we get that power from where, the where it blows and where it's been generated to where people can actually use it. So this takes us into a, a few of the challenges that remain for all of us to solve. One of those is transmission. The wind doesn't blow where we use it. Another one is storage, because the wind doesn't always blow when we use it. We'd like to be able to produce power when the wind is blowing and then use it when we need it. We also need accurate measurements. We need to know what the wind speed is to be able to predict how much power is going to come out of the turbine. And we can also do that by forecasting winds and improving our models. We also need to improve the efficiency and engineering of wind turbines. Remember, we're only e collecting energy with an efficiency of about a third. If we can bring that up, we can produce more power from the same wind. And lastly, wind energy isn't the only renewable energy source that we have to contend with. There are other sources that we didn't go into in much detail today, such as solar and geothermal, which is heat from the interior of the Earth. There's water that flows down rivers. And all of these potentially have power, and all of them are part of the solution to satisfying our need for energy. But they have to be balanced in such a way that the lights stay on and everybody can use their appliances and do what they need to do. So as we've heard a lot about today, wind power is out there, and it's possible for us to harness it for, en for, for energy in our systems. However, if you don't go into wind energy, there won't be people to collect instruments and to um, engineer the turbines and to make it a better place for wind energy. So therefore, we need diverse, innovative, educated population who are interested in careers in wind. So what kind of jobs are out there? You can be a meteorologist like me and have fun climbing towers. That's actually a, a photo of me climbing a tower there and putting up instruments. You can be a computer modeler like Jeff and make really cool forecasting predictions. You can be an engineer and work on turbine design and try to improve the efficiency of our wind turbines. Or you could be a field technician. You can go out and figure out why these turbines aren't working like they should be working. So today, as you uh, listen to us talk, you learned four key things. First, why does the wind blow? And you learned a little bit about solar radiation and the rotation of the Earth, as well as surface characteristics that all cause wind to blow. You also learned about wind turbines and how modern wind turbines actually harness the wind. Third, you learned about the roles of science and engineering in creating more efficient wind turbines. And then lastly, you heard about some challenges that we actually face in wind energy and some that we are giving to you in order to solve. And that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>